Hey everyone, my name is Perry, I'm an electrical engineer, and today we're going to watch Avengers to see how accurate all the science and technology in this movie really are. I know a lot of you guys have been requesting that I do a video on the like nanotechnology in the Iron Man suit and Endgame and Infinity War, and I promise you I will get to that. I just want to get the other Avengers movies out of the way first. So this week we're going to have the first Avengers, and next week I'm going to do Age of Ultron, and then finally we'll get to Infinity War. Thanks so much you guys, I really hope you enjoyed this video because I had a blast making it, it was so much fun watching this movie again and talking about it. And with that, let's get started. My calculations are far from complete. And she's throwing off interference, radiation. Nothing harmful, low levels of gamma radiation. That can be harmful. Actually, uh, Dr. Selvig is right. Low levels of gamma radiation are harmless. They're not going to do anything to you. High levels of gamma radiation are a whole different question. Gamma rays are ionizing waves, which means when they get in contact with you, they're either going to knock off an electron or put one on. An ion is a element or a molecule that has a different number of electrons than it like that it normally comes with. Cations are more positively charged because there's one less electron, so one less negative makes you more positive, whereas anions are negatively charged because one more electron or one more negative will make you more negative. Gamma rays will usually produce cations, and this is why that's important, because in reality, when gamma rays do interact with water, they produce what are called hydroxyl radicals. You don't want those in your body. Those are probably the most reactive like substance that I can think of on Earth. I mean, they will like they latch onto anything and it starts to decay and destroy whatever it is they come in contact with. That's why gamma rays will affect your DNA and just start to decompose your body slowly and slowly. And this is how you develop cancer. And long story short, long term exposure to gamma radiation, you will die. It's just a question of like how long you have to live, not if you can survive it. I did have to do some research and like a little bit of googling because I just haven't worked with turbines in such a long time. I did some calculations of my own and I don't know the exact dimensions but I just thought that like the blade length would be as shown right here, 50 meters and the wind speed would be 22.35 meters per second. Air density is not going to change and so this power coefficient of 0.59, that means that these turbines that I'm calculating for are perfect, as in 100% efficiency, like you literally can't get better than this. So at best, this is what Nick Fury could come up with. So the total amount of power needed to keep a fully loaded Boeing 737 in the air for one day with limitless fuel is 30.8 megawatts. That means if Nick Fury built four perfect turbines, then at best, they could produce enough power to keep four of those planes in the air for one day. This is not counting how much energy you need to actually like spin those turbines at the 50 miles per hour or the 22.35 meters per second because you definitely will need a powerful motor to get them going. I'm also not counting the amount of energy it would take to actually lift this whole thing out of the water and get it into cruising altitude in the first place. But once you actually get them in the air, like that's about it. Like you don't really have much power left to do anything else unless you constantly have planes flying up in the air to fuel them like 24-7, which you, you can certainly do that, but this kind of defeats the purpose of having a floating fortress if you always got to have a plane go up there and like kind of give away its position every single day. Now these retro reflective panels, like they look super cool and I'm going to be honest, like th this technology is pretty simple. All you're doing is you have a camera that's directly above the helicarrier and it's pro like projecting whatever it's collecting from up to beneath it. So like imagine that you have like your phone basically, right, and the camera is facing up this way and you can see the screen on the bottom here. That's exactly what this whole thing is running off of. All the cameras that, like all the images that the cameras are picking up from on top of the helicarrier are being projected to 
like a million screens below it, which is effectively making this thing invisible to people who are underneath it. If you're at the same level as the helicarrier, then you can easily spot it because there's no cameras on the front facing end, it's only the bottom and the top. I still don't know how they were able to cover like the spinning turbines because like it's not like you can just like cover the bottom layer of those with a bunch of cameras that otherwise the wind can't flow between them as easily. So I don't know how they cloaked that part. Even like a helicopter or like one of those really small toy drones, they produce so much noise. They're so loud. So this monster, <laughs> like th there's no point in making it invisible because you're not hiding from anybody. I mean, you're not going to keep this from anyone on radar. And like I said, all you got to do is fly level with it and you can see it easily. Like, I don't think that these invisible retro reflector panels are actually doing anyone any good here. Is this the stuff you need? Yeah, iridium. It's found in meteorites. It forms anti-protons. It's very hard to get hold of. Wow. I'm, I, I'm really impressed. Um, the, uh, iridium, it's real. And it is found in meteorites. And it does form anti-protons. They actually hit all of those points perfectly. An anti-proton is not an electron. It's like it's like the mirror of what an actual proton is. So it has the opposite charge and it has the opposite spin, but it's not an electron. Like it's still a proton, but in a mirror form of it. There are also things called positrons, which are like the mirror form of electrons, but it's like same sort of logic. It's like opposite spin, opposite uh, charge. And both anti-protons and positrons actually form anti-matter. And this is what a lot of research is being done today to figure out what is it? How can we use it? Like, how does it work? I mean, this is like very, very large area of study, which I encourage a lot of you guys to get into. I think there's so much to be discovered in that field. Power at 400% capacity. How about that? Now, when the lightning strikes the Iron Man suit and it charges it to 400% capacity, it's unfortunately not true in the slightest. In the event of a surge in voltage, electronic devices are programmed to short out and just completely shut down in the majority of cases. All of these devices you use, they have an optimal voltage level in which they work, right? Or an optimal voltage range. So if you ever like overshoot or undershoot, basically if you ever go outside the optimal range of voltage, then the device either won't function properly or it just won't function at all. There are like capacitors and other components that can actually hold the charge, but it, like those have their limits too. And when you have lightning being shot at you, you're not gonna charge everything to its like highest potential and then beyond. Like everything has its limits and you actually, you can't exceed them because if you do, the electronic won't work. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like it's gonna work way better or way faster. It just won't work at all. Even when you specifically design a way to harness the power from a lightning bolt, you, you almost will always fail because for one, like not all bolts have the same power. So it's not like you can build something that can only absorb a certain amount of energy or take in a certain number of voltage. Like it, it, there's just too much uncertainty with each like lightning bolt that strikes. Tony Stark wouldn't have four times the amount of power he usually does. The suit would probably just altogether stop working because it's connected to the arc reactor in Tony's chest. I think when that lightning bolt strikes him, he Tony will certainly die. I mean. I, I, I don't think there's a way he can actually walk out of there alive. I'll tell you one really cool thing about this scene is that you can do this. When Tony is falling out of a building here, he's falling in free fall, which means the only force really acting upon him is the force of gravity on whatever planet he's falling on, which in this case is Earth. So the acceleration due to gravity on Earth is 9.81 meters per second squared. And it's also not like the longer he's falling, the faster he'll get. What will actually happen is that Tony will reach terminal velocity, which means after a few seconds of just falling like in free fall, you, you're not going to get any quicker. You're going to find just like one speed and it'll be that all the rest of the way down. To calibrate anything, 
you need to have at least one fixed point, which in this case, that fixed point is Tony's bracelet. When the suit reads it, that's how it knows where to put all of the other components and how it all matches up to his body. On the same token, it's not like that suit has to continuously like fall faster and faster to catch Tony. Once he's at terminal velocity, and this thing is actually like thrusting itself down towards him on like the side of gravity, it can easily reach Tony before he falls to the ground and this will save him. This scene was so cool. <laughs> So this is essentially a wormhole in space and it's connecting one area in space with another area on Earth and let me get a sheet of paper. So this is how a wormhole works. In this highly detailed diagram, basically you have something going into the wormhole here and normally you would have to travel, if you wanna get from this point to that point, you'd have to go along the dotted line and just basically follow it through space. However, what a wormhole is doing is you're starting like in this circle and you're going, you're skipping all that distance and going directly here. And how you do that is space will actually fold itself like this. All of that like extra space right here that normally you'd have to travel is completely bypassed. It's like a shortcut in space. The way that a nuclear bomb would explode in space is going to be a little bit different than the way that it would explode here on Earth. And the, the biggest reason for that is just because Earth has an atmosphere, whereas space is a vacuum. This like giant explosion that just blew up like the mothership, you would never actually see this in space because there's no air to actually heat up, right? Like for a fire, you need to have some sort of fuel, but there's nothing to actually ignite in space. That giant like beam of light, like that was super bright, that would still happen, but the, the fission reaction that would occur in a nuclear bomb, it wouldn't have as much range because there's no molecules around it to actually bounce off of and transfer energy to. So you wouldn't really feel like, it, it wouldn't be much heat either because there's just nothing to actually like vibrate to produce all the energy that would dissipate throughout all the environment around you. I'm not actually sure why the Iron Man suit lost power though, because, and or like even more than that, I don't know why Tony passed out because the Iron Man suit needs to have a like supply of oxygen inside of it. Otherwise he would never be able to fly on earth going up and down various elevations without that constant supply of oxygen. And you can survive in space without breathing for a few minutes. I mean, you can hold your breath underwater and you won't die instantly or you won't pass out either. So I don't know why he just passed out so quickly, like, and why the suit lost power. I, I, that doesn't make any sense to me. I guess it could be that he was close enough so that the electromagnetic pulse affected him. Although I doubt it because it seemed like he was pretty far from the explosion and definitely outside of his blast radius. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed that video, man. Anything else you want me to watch in the future, go ahead, comment it down below, and I'll check out whatever movie or TV show you guys want me to. Thank you guys so much once again. Stay fresh and stay golden.